Hi, my name's Vin Sheehan, and today I'd like to talk about Kant, a very short introduction by Roger Scruton. I'd like to go through this short book exploring how it outlines the highlights of Kant's achievements in philosophy. Now, of course, uh, Roger Scruton was a philosopher himself and wrote much about aesthetics. He was also quite a well-known uh, conservative cultural commentator uh, in, in the latter years of his life. Um, he, he, I think he passed away a couple of years ago of cancer. He wrote this originally in 1981, but it was republished as part of the very short introduction series published by OUP in 2001. Now, from the outset, um, Scruton explains that this is a difficult uh, book to read because Kant isn't easy to distill into such a slim volume. Um, and as someone who hasn't got any formal training in philosophy, but very interested in most things actually, I had to give this book a couple of reads to get my head around some of these, these big uh, ideas of Immanuel Kant. And of course, as Scruton reminds us at the beginning, Kant is an absolute central figure in modern philosophy. His critique of pure reason really reinvigorated uh, the study of metaphysics and gave us a new understanding of the nature of reality, of epistemology, and, um, and also something of a synthesis of, of rationalism and empiricism. Now, at the beginning of this uh, book, um, Scruton outlines Kant's life, which is uh, pretty unremarkable, as Scruton uh, tells us. Um, he, was, he was born and lived in the town of Königsberg in uh, Germany, which is uh, now Kaliningrad. And um, he was born into an extremely devout family, pietists, the Bible and religious observance would have been paramount in his life, a strict upbringing. And Kant eventually managed to um, secure a comfortable lifestyle for himself through his work at Königsberg University. And he never married and he lived a fairly austere, highly disciplined yet eccentric lifestyle. He didn't have many possessions. Apparently one of the only things he owned was a portrait of Rousseau. And um, his life was very much dictated by routine and duty. Um, perhaps not surprising from the man who put forward the idea of the categorical imperative. And Scruton also outlines Kant's main work, um, chief amongst his publications being, of course, the critique of pure reason. Now in chapter two, Scruton um, gives a brief purview of um, Kant's philosophical background, who uh, influenced him and uh, who formed the kind of intellectual environment in which he wrote. And there was two predominant contrasting philosophies um, which helped uh, form Immanuel Kant. One is rationalism. Um, which, of course, developed out of the Cartesian idea of questioning everything, but then coming to the uh, idea that the only thing that can't be questioned is the fact that one is thinking, called jito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, of course. Then following um, Descartes, we have um, Leibniz, who um, believed in reason being the... Uh, the way we achieve true knowledge. Um, but then in opposition to Leibniz and rationalism, we have David Hume and his empiricism. David Hume, of, of course, believing that everything we can know comes from experience or sensation and uh, whittling down the power of reason and therefore metaphysics into almost nothing. For Hume, everything real, everything what we can know is can be tested around us. Now it's David Hume which um, caused Kant really to um, write 
the critique of pure reason. Famously, Kant was roused out of his dogmatic slumbers by David Hume's empiricism. And Kant finds this kind of middle way, which has come to be called transcendental idealism, with the kind of promoting of synthetic a priori truths. Now, in chapters three and four, Scruton navigates the intricacies of transcendental idealism as outlined in the Critique of Pure Reason. And these two chapters take a few rereadings if you're not familiar with, um, with Kant or his philosophy. Um, and there's some excellent YouTube um, lectures about this as well, which, including some by Scruton, which I found very helpful. In chapter three, we find out something about how Kant forms this middle way, this transcendental deduction between our judgments, understanding formed from experience, the subjective deduction, and also with the objective deduction, which is a priori truths, uh, pure reason, etc. Now Kant argues that before we can even make a judgment on something formed by our experience, our sensations, we are kind of hardwired with these concepts which are derived from pure reason, a priori truths, which we can do nothing about, they're just there. So everything we experience is kind of filtered through uh, these lenses, I suppose, of uh, these concepts and describes these categories through which we experience the world, including uh, substance itself, causality, and, uh, and also, interestingly, time and space themselves, which he doesn't describe as categories. He sees them outside of these categories. Um, they're in a kind of a thing of themselves, but nevertheless, they're with the categories, helping us see things, how we see them in, in reality. Um, we're kind of inbuilt with these lenses through which we experience the world. And we can't experience these things how they really are <laughs> without these lenses. It's just impossible for us. That's in the kind of metaphysical realm of pure reason, which we are not party to. Nevertheless, there is that element to reality as well as our own perception experience. This is this synthesis, this transcendental uh, deduction, idealism that Kant uh, describes in in his uh, critique of pure reason. So it's quite amazing how Kant has uh, bridged the world of Leibniz and rationalism and uh, human empiricism and kind of transcended both of them into this new synthesis, this new understanding of epistemology. Now this ability of the mind to view uh, reality through this prism of the concepts, the principles and of space and time, um, Kant called the transcendental unity of apperception. In chapter four, Scruton outlines Kant's ideas of the noumenon, which is the world as it really is in terms of pure reason, uh, the perspectiveless world without those prisms those lenses of time and space, etc. And then there's the world we actually experience called the phenomenon. And Kant says that you can't really divorce pure reason from experience. Experience and uh, reason needs each other for us to make uh, sense of the world. We shouldn't rely on one at the expense of the other. So then um, in chapter five, Scruton moves on and discusses Kant's incredibly groundbreaking idea of the categorical imperative. Kant believed that we have this innate um, freedom to follow the promptings of pure reason, this kind of objective morality, this, this, this law that exists. Um, and this is how we should live our lives. This is uh, Kant in the field of ethics. And um, he believed in the autonomy of the will, in other words. And it ends up being very similar um, to the golden rule, which Kant would, of course, been 
extremely familiar with from his Christian upbringing, uh, which is also in, uh, found in other religions as well, that of um, doing to others as you'd want to be done to yourself. Um, Kant very strongly believes in seeing the other person as an end rather than a means. So, um, so it holds a very high opinion of of human life, really, of of other people. Our actions should be guided by doing what's right, um, which derives from reason, and not serving ourselves, but really having this uh, this idea of of being good citizens and and helping others. Although Kant's religious beliefs by now are um, not strictly orthodox, he does believe that this in categorical imperative points towards the divine, towards God himself. In chapter 6, Scruton moves on to Kant's thoughts on aesthetics, on beauty and truth and design. And Kant uh, wrote about much of this in his third critique of aesthetics. And in a, in a similar way to how he, f he felt we should view other people as uh, ends rather than means, Kant suggests that we should see things, objects, things of beauty as ends in themselves rather than means. Um, so we should look at them divorced from our own passions, but examine things and see the beauty through, uh, through our innate reason. And again, a bit like the categorical imperative, Kant believed that such glimpses of beauty um, which we may experience on earth, um, perhaps more in nature than in the arts, according to Kant, uh, kind of point us again to uh, the reality of God, four tastes of heaven, if you like. And then the final chapter is about Kant as the leading light of the Enlightenment, how Kant believed that politically everybody should be free to serve society under the guidance and submission to reason, regardless of class, etc. So I guess in this respect, Kant was fairly progressive. He seemed to like the idea of countries coalescing together in transnational leagues and federations. He believed in some kind of social contract um, whereby citizens were free to follow the categorical imperative. And of course, following on from the categorical imperative, central to Kant's politics was of course the idea that everyone should be respected, um, seen not as means to something else, but ends in themselves. Kant wasn't a proponent of democracy as such, but he did believe uh, that uh, people being free to, uh, to live their lives following the categorical imperative, really make a difference to the world. And uh, Scruton has a few words on Kant's enormous legacy as well at the end. So, I mean, this book is incredibly dense, but I just think it's one of the best very short introductions. It really piqued my interest in Immanuel Kant and his philosophy. Um, and as Scruton says, you know, it does take a few reads to get your head around some of these ideas. I'm not sure if I've even got my head around some of these ideas after reading it a few times. Um, and I do recommend reading it in conjunction with looking at some lectures on Kant on YouTube. But this is a really valuable uh, introduction to this uh, difficult uh, but incredibly significant philosopher who changed much about how we believe we can know the world as well as how we should live our lives as well as perhaps what reality really is anyway so yeah a really good book i do recommend it please let me know uh, what you think of kant and uh, that would be great all right thank you bye